1 Samuel chapter 1, there was a certain man, somebody say a certain man, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah. Somebody say a certain man. He had two wives, and the name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other one was Paniah. And Paniah had children. I'm going to pronounce these the easy way, so you can go and do your Hebrew, click the microphone button and find out what it really says, but for today, her name is Paniah. But Hannah had no children. Now, this man used to go year by year, somebody say every year, from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. Skip to verse 4. And on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penia. Remember, she's the quote-unquote fruitful wife. And to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously just to irritate her. Oh, somebody ought to snatch her up. Because the, some of you in here that halfway saved, you would have snatched her up. Because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, that she would provoke her. I'm going to tell you right now, Hannah is better than me. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Bear in mind that her husband had given her double portion, but she could not even eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Many scholars say that right here he was referring to how many sons that Paniah had. Am I not more than you than ten sons? And after they had eaten and after they had drunk in Shiloh, somebody say, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple and she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly and she vowed a vow and said, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and forget not thou servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And this is key right here, this phrase, if you read the Bible, no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord and Eli observed her mouth. Just church folk now, this is the priest. Hannah was speaking in her heart, but only moved her lips and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunk. And Eli said to her, woman, how long you plan on being drunk? Put your 40 down. Put your wine down. But Hannah answered, no, 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 no. Mr. Priest, Mr. Priest, my Lord, you've got it mistaken. I am a woman of troubled spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation, which actually means a daughter of Belial or daughter of the devil. This is a, that's a whole nother message. But verse 17, then Eli answered, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition that you've made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate. Is she pregnant right now? It ain't a trick question. You know how people get pregnant, right? Okay, just, just making sure. <laughs> just checking. Okay. The answer is No. The woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So she's still barren, but she's been healed. Oh, my, 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 my. She didn't wait on a child to get her face right and to get her emotions right. She's still barren, but she's already walking in the blessing before Samuel ever gets here. And she rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and they went back to their house and Elkanah knew his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her and in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel. Today I want to minister to you a message called this, my valley is about to testify. Oh, my valley 
is about to testify. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're facing, but I'm here to declare and decree today that your valley is about to testify. I prophesy to that valley you've been walking through, and I declare and decree that you shall rise up and testify before you get to the other side. We declare today that valley seasons are about to be rendered weak and testify of the goodness of God. So the overarching idea that I want you to go home with today is this. Good students in the barren place become qualified stewards of the blessed place. I said good students in the barren place become qualified stewards of the blessed place. You want to steward a blessing? You better be a good student in that valley because that valley is qualifying you to handle the weight of the blessing in this next season. I want to talk to you about the lifespan and the cycle of valley so that we can articulate where we are in the valley and know how to pursue God in that. Are you ready for this word? Can you lift your hands up before the Lord as a sign of surrender? Heavenly Father, we surrender to you. Teach us your ways that we may know you and find your favor. For there it is no doubt that we see your glory. Lord, we need you. Hallelujah. There's nobody greater. Lord, I need to testify nobody greater than you. And I love you, I love you, I love you. Minister your word today with precision as you always do. Let not man get in the way, but let your word go forth clear and concise. In every spirit but the Holy Spirit, leave now in the name of Jesus. And we bless you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, and somebody say amen. Before you're seated, find two or three people, slap them upside the back of the head and tell them it's time to testify. Come on, it's, it's time to testify. I welcome everybody joining us online this morning at Kingdom Culture. I'm Pastor Jeremy. It is an honor to have you. If you're in the Central Florida area, we are here every Sunday at 8.30, 10.30, and 12.30. And I don't know about you, but I think this is a great place to call home. Come on. Can we welcome everybody joining online? Today I'm going to minister a message called My Valley is About to Testify, and we are coming out of the text from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 through 20. Now, I am convinced this morning I am convinced, and you can't convince me otherwise, that every season that we're in presents us with both valleys and blessings. That every season that we're in, we have barren and we have blessed spots. Now, not every moment is as great or as intense as others, but we are always stewarding a present blessing and navigating a barren valley whether it's family or finance or emotions are a mess or maybe some mental turmoil or a career question or a health concern or fears or doubts or there's wayward sons and daughters. There are things you're believing God for that you've yet to see. I believe in every season you are stewarding something that is blessed, but you're also in a barren place believing for something that is yet to come to pass. And Hannah was a woman that was very familiar with this process. And if we were to read the headline of her life in a local newspaper, I believe it would read something like this. Hannah, barren woman, births prophetic blessing. Barren woman, births prophetic blessing. And I'm here to declare today that there's some barren places in your life that are about to give forth birth to an absolute blessing that comes from God. I just read to you one chapter. One chapter of her life, which is actually years and years encapsulated into one chapter of her navigating the intensity of a barren valley season. But Hannah understood the process from barrenness to being blessed. She understood the gap in between the seed and the time. And she knew that there was something in the barren place that prepared her for the blessed place. Now, when we say barren places today, I understand, men, that they may not, that might not apply to you, but let me take you spiritually to what I'm talking about. We are the bride of Christ. The reason we are the bride is because we house a womb, and there are times in our life that we have barren wombs. The word barren and what we mean with barren is at a place where a seed has been planted and watered, but yet to produce. Are there any areas of your life that you have planted seed, you've watered? watered it, but you've yet to see it come into fruition. You've yet to see it produce. That's no matter how intense it is, 
no matter how small it is, that would be considered a barren place. A womb is our capacity to house spiritual assignments and blessings, whether it's from God or from the enemy. So we all have a womb. The womb is the place that we house assignments from God. And often that womb seems barren because a seed has been put there, but time has not gone past enough to let that which is in us come into fruition. And we all have those places, do we not? And so here's the first lesson that we've got to learn about valleys is this. Number one, valleys teach us. Have you ever learned anything in your valley? Valleys teach us at some point in our spiritual journey. Our perspective of valleys must mature beyond demonic attacks. Of course, the enemy's attacking you. And we give the devil so much credit in our life for everything that goes wrong. Yes, demons attack you. We got it. We know. That is ground floor. That is easy for everyone to see. The enemy hates you blessed. Of course, the enemy is attacking you. But mature believers know that, yes, valleys are places of demonic activity. But more than that, valleys are classrooms. Immature believers only view valleys as the devil don't like me. The devil's after me. The devil's mad at me. Duh! He can't stand you walking in the favor of God. We know that. Let's move on. It's time to now mature into a perspective that views valleys not as just demonic attacks, but as classrooms that provide us with the opportunity to graduate to a higher level of stewardship. Oh, I'm going to preach this morning. Come on and preach with me. My valley is presenting me with an opportunity to graduate to a higher level of stewardship. So I am in this valley, and whether God allowed me to or put me here or allowed me to be here, he wants to graduate me to a higher level of glory or a higher level of stewardship. Valleys are teaching us something. And Hannah is standing in her own valley classroom. She is watching her rival, Panaya reap all these children. And I can imagine that she feels left out, battling extreme emotions, anxiety, worry, fears. Will my womb ever produce? Have you ever wondered in a season, did I miss God? Or God, are you ever going to come through and do what you promised? Have you ever wondered if you were ever going to produce that assignment that God has placed on your life? This is exactly where Hannah is. And if we look at the data that she has access to, which would have been the Torah at the time, if we look at the stories that she would have had access to, she stands in the company of great women that could testify that God God specializes in bringing blessings to barren places. She could have looked back over the life of Rebecca, who for 20 years had been in a barren place. She could have looked back over the life of Rachel, who requested to die because her barrenness was so severe. She could have looked back over the life of the patriarch Sarah, who for 25 years wrestled with the insecurity of barrenness. Yet Hannah is in her own waiting valley. She's in her own season, and she is waiting on God to come through. Can I tell you this morning that one of the hardest subjects to navigate in the valley school is the subject called wait on the Lord. It was like Spanish was for me in high school. I couldn't hardly graduate high school because I was trying so hard to figure out how to spell como estas. (laughs) To me in the kingdom, one of the hardest subjects to navigate is the classroom called wait on the Lord. And some of you would say, no kidding, I've been waiting so long, I got an, I'm in the honors class. I'm in the AP class on that. But I've found that nothing refines our trust in the Lord like the weight of the valley. I said, nothing refines your trusting in the Lord like waiting in the valley. You got to wait in that valley to learn a valuable lesson that you're not going to do this without God. You're not going to make it without Him. And until you learn that you can't do this in your own strength, that you can't do this with your own power, that you can't do this with the degrees that hang upon your wall, you can't do this with the money that's in your bank account, there are some assignments every time that God places something in your life, it requires the... You, after you have already given everything you have, it requires you to allow God to step in and do what only he can do. I'll tell you, while we were gone on a chance to rest, 
for a little while, my family and I, we just, we had a beautiful time together um, in the Lord. And I had a dream one night. Now, I don't dream that often. I tend to get visions more for me. I don't know if anybody else is like that, but I tend to get visions more. And I think it's just because in Joel, it says that old men dream dreams. <laughs> and young men have visions. I'm, I'm still hanging on to my youth. And I had a dream, though, so I think I might be transitioning. <laughs> Typically, I have visions, but on this one night, I had a dream. And I want to, I've always said that I believe that the greatest discourse of spiritual leadership is to give away your walk with Jesus. And so I want to give away my walk with Jesus and an encounter I had with Jesus while I was gone and had a chance to just spend time with the Lord. I was kind of navigating my own valley moments in my mind. I had a lot on my mind. I knew there was a lot to accomplish. I knew there were a lot of things that needed to get done. I knew there was a lot of turmoil and things that had to be addressed. And I fell asleep in kind of some of my own valley moments. Just, you ever just, in your mind, when you lay down at night and things are quiet, your mind is just running, 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 running. And I'm trying to surrender these thoughts to the Lord. And I lay down and finally I go to sleep. I go into a deep sleep and I begin to dream, a very vivid dream. Those dreams where you can feel the emotions that are connected to it. The dreams where you can literally see yourself and see emotional expressions and you know that you are there and don't realize it's not real until you wake up. That was the depth of this dream that I had. I had this dream and I was coming back off of a time of rest and I was prepared. You know me, I don't step up in a pulpit unless I am prepared, unless I have studied. I never get up and just wing it. There's never a week that doesn't go without extensive studying and laying before the Lord. I was prepared and I got to the stage for some reason with my book bag and it was about my turn to preach, my time to get up and preach. And I reached down into my book bag to get my notes and my notes aren't there. And I instantly think, why didn't they print my notes? I know I sent those notes over. I know good and well I did it because I worked real hard on it. Why in the world didn't Nicole print these notes out? And so I'm looking through, I'm looking through, I'm looking through, and, so, and somebody else on staff, another director or pastor said, well, well, pastor, we'll just use your iPad. You can use your iPad, and we'll set up a stool for you right here. And I said, I don't want to preach on no stool. I ain't wired like that. You know I got to move around. They said, it's okay. We'll put a bookshelf right here. The bookshelf represented human knowledge. And we will hide you behind the bookshelf. And I opened the iPad, and the iPad goes dead. Now, Pastor Jamil and the team are literally on their last part of the song. You can feel the song winding down. So somebody else says, Pastor, Pastor, run over here. So run over here backstage. It was, it was backstage like this. And at, in this building, I noticed that the building, it was kingdom culture, but it was four times this size. It was four or five times this size. And I remember looking over my shoulder thinking, ooh, the church has gotten bigger, but there were five people in the church. So I run over here behind the stage, and they set up my computer, and they can't pull up the document. And they can't figure out what's wrong. And finally, I put my hand down on that table, and I said, listen, people need to hear the gospel. I said, keep the notes. I'm going out to preach. We ain't got time for all this mess. The Lord's going to lead me. And I stood up on the stage and instantly the same room within seconds was filled to capacity and the overflows were filled. I'm talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And I woke up like this and began to preach. And I said, Lord, you couldn't let me sleep to feel the power of God move. He just woke me up. And listen, if I'm going to wake up from a, for a spiritual dream to become one, she got to wake up too so I reached over to her I pushed her like this and I said baby you baby let me tell you about this dream she says uh, okay and I expected her to be a little bit more att attentive and I said babe what do you think that means she looked over at me she said you need to trust the Lord <laughs> and went right back to sleep that's the first lady And so I got up, it's still dark, and I go out on a walk because I'm like, Lord, I am not going back to sleep. I'm going to accept the invitation to be intimate with you in this moment. And I started to walk with the Lord. And I said, Lord, you've got to teach me. And he said this, son, I wrote it down. I remind you 
You cannot do this in your own strength. Trust me greater, and I will feel you greater. Trust me greater, and I will feel you greater. Hannah was going every year to church trying to have children with her own strengths. But if valleys have taught me anything, they have taught me that I can't do it without him. I can't make it without Jesus. I can't build it without him. You're not going to buy your way out of this valley. You're not going to get advice to get you out. You can't religion your way out. The only way for you to get out of this valley and into the next season is you got to depend on the Lord. You got to depend. Well, Pastor, that seems so simple. Well, let me ask you what are you doing right now that you're doing without the Lord? You ain't going to do it without me, son. And I'll leave you in this valley till you learn to trust me. I'll leave you in this classroom till you learn to depend on me. I'll strip all your strength away till you realize that I am God and I am God alone. I'll let that pride die. I'll let the selfish ambition die until you realize that you cannot move forward. You can't breathe without me. And whenever you get to the place in your life where you've learned to trust in Jesus and you've learned to depend on his word there's not a more beautiful place to be than knowing yes they may be coming against you but greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world can you imagine being under attack mama and still laying down your head and getting eight hours of sleep at night because you know that when the morning rises his mercy comes up with it can you imagine getting a bad doctor's report and still skipping and hopping your way into church because you know whom the son has set free is free and Indeed, can you imagine waking up in the morning knowing you're fighting a financial stress but depending on the Lord because he said he's Jehovah Jireh and El Shaddai. Oh, can you imagine the weight that's lifted when you stop trying to produce on your own? Can you imagine how church would change if preachers would stop trying to entertain and just let the power of God do what he wants to do? I break performance anxiety off of you in the name of Jesus. I break it off this church. I break it off the body of Christ. And I declare in Jesus' name, you don't have to perform. You have to trust. Oh, it's good to be home. And as I was spending time with the Lord, I want to give this away to you. I received classroom revelations. And I saw myself, you know, in, in school, I asked a lot of questions, believe it or not. I talked a lot, believe it or not. I know you would think Pastor Missy did most of the talking in school, but it was actually me, I want to tell you. You're supposed to raise your hands to speak, you know, and glad I, I didn't do that too much. But I saw myself raising my hands in this classroom valley when I was walking and praying. Now I'm in a vision, I'm feeling good because I feel young again. I'm in a vision and I get five questions to ask God during valley seasons. My teacher, I want to ask him these questions. Number one, what immature areas of my life are being exposed so that I may spiritually mature? What desires do I have that need to die? What areas of my life are over controlling and not trusting you? What hard places in my heart need to be softened, number four? And number five, what are you about to do in my life that this valley has given me the tools for? Those are the five questions that I am now asking God in every valley or barren era of area of my life that is yet to produce. I'm saying, okay, Lord, is there an immature place in my life that I need to grow up? Are there desires in me that need to die? Are there areas that I'm not trusting you in that you're trying to expose? Is my heart hardened and need to be softened? And what are you doing in my life that requires the tools that this valley has given me? So now after the valley teaches us, now we move in to the valley provokes us. It teaches us, now it's going to provoke you. It's in the valleys that our enemy tries to convince us that what you're believing for is never going to happen. It shall never happen. Some of you have given up praying and believing God for something because the enemy has told you that it's not going to happen. 
The enemy has been tormenting you and he wants to torment you so that you lose sight of God. Don't miss this in the scripture. Hannah has double portion, right? Double portion. Is that correct? But when it comes, double portion to even eat on. But Hannah can't even enjoy what she has because she is lusting over something that she does not have yet. She has double portion and she cannot even eat. I want to tell you that tormenting spirits rob thanksgiving by making you lust over what you don't have while blinding you to the blessings that you do have. You got to stop waiting on a reason to praise God and you got to know that you've already got a reason to praise God. You already have double portion. You already have the blood. You already have the broken body. You already have an empty tomb. You got a reason to praise him. You got a reason to thank him. But the enemy will say in these little tormenting spirits to cause you to lust over what you don't have and rob you from praising God for what you currently have. So Hannah needed a wake-up call. God is still in charge. And God was about to wake Hannah up, so here comes the rival. Here comes the rival. Verse 6, and her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her. Because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year that as often as she went up to the house of the Lord. When, when did she start provoking her? When? When she went to the house of the Lord. Every time she went to the place where the source was, the enemy started to provoke, provoke her. Every time she went to the source and got close, the enemy tried to remind her of what she did not have. And it happened year after year, that every year she went up to the Lord that she got provoked. Now, Paniah's name is significant in this text. Paniah's name means a shiny jewel. It denotes something shiny to appearance, but possess no real value. What's that fake diamond called? What's it called? Cubic zirconiums? Z Say it. Cubic zirconiums. It's cubic zirconiums. I guess that's more than one of them. Cubic zirconium. She, she was shiny, but no real value. It literally means to only reflect oneself. Let me say this. Not everything that looks good carries value for your life. Just because it's bright, don't make it right. It might look good. You're going you to mess around, and we are going to have church today. Just because it looks good doesn't mean it has value for your life. You better be careful and cautious in valley seasons. Be cautious who you talk to. Be cautious who you get close to. Be cautious where you cast your pearls. Be cautious what you listen to, including demonic voices in your own head. Because there are some that have been assigned to your valley to keep you in the valley. They like you better when you're barren. They like you better when you're down. They are there to support the soul of your seed but they hate the reaping of your harvest they view your womb as a threat and the enemy will use their voice to vex you and make you feel hopeless but Hannah like all of us had to make a valley decision do I allow this valley to work me over or do I make it work in my favor I can sit in this valley and let the enemy convince me that I will never make it or I can make this valley work in my favor oh you gotta make up in your mind today that whatever you're going through whatever you're in the middle of that that valley is not going to do you over but you're going to make that valley work in your favor yeah 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 it's going to work in my favor God's going to turn this thing around. I refuse to give up in the valley. I refuse to lose hope in the valley. I refuse to get vexed in the valley. I refuse to believe the report of the liar and the accuser of the brethren. I choose to believe the report of the Lord. So they sitting there eating. They're sitting there all together. I don't know how this whole, did, did, trust me when I tell you God's idea was never the, 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 the little three thing they had going on. Okay, so I, I'm not preaching that. But he had two wives. Wrong. <laughs> they all sitting together eating. Hannah's got double portion. Paniah's got single. Elkanah's got whatever he wants. And she has been provoked. And after they had ate 
And after they drank in Shiloh, watch what the Bible says. If you read the word, it'll talk to you. Two words, Hannah rose. (laughs) Hannah got up and excused herself from dinner. She said, wait just a second. Threw her finger up and said, excuse me, I'm done with dealing with this mess. She dismissed herself, and I feel like today that somebody in this room is about to say, excuse me, I gotta dismiss myself from this mess. I gotta dismiss myself from this discord. I'm gonna dismiss myself from this fear. I'm gonna dismiss myself from this doubt. I am dismissing myself from the dinner table that's trying to provoke me to be something less. I feel like today somebody is about to rise. Somebody's had enough not fulfilling your purpose. Somebody in this room needs to excuse yourself and say, I'm done letting this punk mess with my purpose. But I'm going to turn the enemy's provoke into a place of pursuit. I'm going to use the provoking of the enemy to pursue the face of God. Oh, Jesus. Yo, I thank God for the valley. My praise got louder in the valley. My prayers got more desperate in the valley. My worship got more sincere in the valley. If you will allow it, nothing stirs a fervent intimacy like the provoking of a valley season. It's in my valleys I realize something. I want the blesser more than I want the blessing. I'm in the valley praying, God, that the, that the blessing would pull me out of the valley. But let me tell you, it's in the valley I realize, man, I want you more than I want the blessing. I want your presence more than I want anything. If I never get the money, if it never looks right, if it never comes to pass. I remember laying down in a nasty cafeteria floor that had all kind of stuff. This was before COVID ever exists. There was COVID times 10 on this nasty floor. I remember putting my face down in that cafeteria floor when we had just gotten and told no on a building that we thought for sure was God's building and I laid in that floor I'll never forget it and I said God I said if you never give us a building I'll worship you in this cafeteria the rest of my life and I won't complain because I'd rather have you in a nasty stinky cafeteria than a shiny new building and you not be in the room but I'm here to testify today that it was on that cafeteria it was on that floor that God God said, now I've got you in a place. Now I've got you. I've taught you. You've been provoked to pursue me. Now I can bless you. The blessing is great, but I want him. I want him. I want Jesus. I need Jesus. Give me Jesus. Only Jesus. You can have the world, but give me Jesus. You can have the money, just give me Jesus. You can have the fame, just give me Jesus. You you can have it all, just give me Jesus. Somebody push your neighbor and tell him, say, I just want Jesus, I just want Jesus, I just want Jesus. If we never get a bigger building, I just want Jesus. If nobody else ever comes, I just want Jesus. If I never get the money I thought, I just want Jesus. If nobody ever knows my name, I just want Jesus. Give me Jesus now. Give me Jesus in November. Give me Jesus after the election. Give me Jesus for the rest of my life. Give me Jesus. Hannah is losing her mind. I wouldn't sit down yet. I know where I'm going. Hannah is losing her mind. Praising God. I mean losing her mind. Blessing the Lord. Don't you be surprised. When you start getting real passionate about the things of God, don't you get surprised when a spirit of Eli shows up and tries to tell you you're drunk. Eli shows up to Hannah while she's praising and said, woman, how long? 
How long you going to be sipping on that strong drink? How long you going to be drunk? In other words, it don't take all that. Why you got to do the most? Why you got to wave flags on stage? Why are you preaching so hard? Why are you sweating so much? This is my first time at this church. They got some kind of growling thing back in the background Why he's preaching. I don't even know what's going on. Why is their worship so emotional? Why in the world? And Hannah looked at Eli and said to him, Eli, no, 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 my Lord. You must, you must got it twisted. First off, I ain't even here for you. I ain't here to please you. I'm not here to put on a show for you. This is not a source of entertainment. This is my God. I'm desperate for him. You've mistaken it. I've been pouring my soul out. I've been blessing his name. I've been calling on him. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm struggling with. You don't know for years what's been happening in my life. So Eli, you're going to have to shut up and let me worship. She said, I poured out my grief. I poured out my pain. I poured out the what ifs. I poured out the doctor's report. I poured out my pride. I poured out my fears. I poured out my doubt. I want to go ahead and let it be known. Kingdom Culture Church is a place you can pour it out before the Lord. And folks ain't going to worry if you've been drinking some old wine. They know you drinking a different kind of wine. I declare this is a house that you can look drunk if you want to. You might walk straight in, but you're going to stumble on the way out. You might walk in thinking you got it figured out, but you're going to walk out knowing that had it not been for the, had it not been for the Lord on my side. Oh! I thank God for every time, Pastor John, I've been provoked. I'm telling you right now that my valleys created the praiser that you see up here right here my valleys created the worship that you see up here because i can't i can't come into the presence of god and not think i wouldn't be here today if it was not for him so so i'm gonna tell you when is the last time when's the last time that you went before the lord and poured out what was holding your future hostage Oh, it's a poured out season. We about to lay everything at his feet in this season. As we move into God's new year, I'm telling you, I'm not going in carrying anything. I'm not going in striving. But when's the last time you poured out before the Lord what was holding your future hostage? Besides, never allow a less desperate Eli stop your desperate pursuit of El Shaddai. Why would you let someone on your road that's less desperate affect the kind of praise that you give God? Did you come to church for them to see your new outfit? Or did you come to church to lift up holy hands, to let shout with a voice of, why did you come to church today? You didn't come because Pastor Jeremy was coming back because we didn't advertise it. You didn't know I was coming back. You came here to bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me. So, so valleys teach us, valleys provoke us, and valleys break us. I saw a couple of you sat down right then. You thought we was done shouting. But before you get upset at me and say that God would never break me. God don't break. God, God would never break me. God would never break. As Jacob, wrestling with an angel, first person in history to get a hip replacement. Ask Joseph, coat of many colors, but he's sitting in a pit. Favor of God on his life, but he's sitting in a prison. Oh, that's Old Testament. All right, ask Jesus when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's saying, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, be thy will. He, even Jesus had to get broken in the valley of the Garden of Gethsemane. 
God will use your valley to break your fleshly desires. Make no mistake about it. And God will leave you in a valley until your desires turn into his desires. Now the typology of this text is, keep in mind, you can sit down if you want. Or you can stay standing. But I'm going to preach this thing on home. The typology in this text is, watch, a son, you cannot miss this part. We built this whole moment to hear a son is her will. Samuel is God's will. Watch. Don't get, don't, don't, look, a son, you say, well, they're, they're both boys, and she didn't know. The, no, 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 don't. No, don't, 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 don't go so natural on me. Look at this spiritually. She wants a son because her tormentor, had tormented her into a false ideology that she needed a son, not a specific son. So she thinks now that she needs a son. She is carrying the womb for Samuel, but she's willing to give Samuel up for just a regular old son. Now I want you to keep in mind that the woman that is provoking her, she got a bunch of no-name sons. Her sons don't even have a name in scripture. You don't even know who her sons are. Why in the world are you letting the enemy with a bunch of no-name illegitimate children running around tell you what kind of babies you need to birth in the spiritual realm? Why in the world would you listen to a no-name, good-for-nothing, double-crossing, sorry, slimy, ugly devil when you know God's already promised you a thing? So no name, sister no name, is provoking her and watch, impressing on her and inviting her into a false image and to have a covenant with a false image. And one of the ways the enemy torments us is he'll use media, social media, news, people, sometimes even family and close friends that don't even mean harm. But the enemy will use them to invite you into a covenant with false images. What is a false image? Something you produce to please others. Something you produce to please others. And for years she wanted a son to produce a projected image. How much effort, prayers have we prayed, time have we wasted trying to build images to please others? How much time have we wasted trying to build an image to please somebody else? And when you build the image everyone wants you to build, you will never be satisfied because the image you produce will have no oil and it will carry no power. Go ahead and produce that image if you want to. But know that it's got no oil on it. It carries no power. If it, you can try to be whoever it is that you want to be, but until you be who God created you to be, there will be no oil and there will be no power and you'll be unfulfilled because God will never bless what you produce that doesn't come from him. I don't care how hard you work. You can hustle every day real hard, real good. You can get up and work and you can get on your G-R-I-N-D. You can get on your grind. But at the end of the day, that everything you produce outside of his presence, the only way you sustain it is with killing yourself. Because God's not going to bless what you produce that doesn't come from him. But at verse 11 came her breaking point, And she said, I make a vow unto you, Lord, to giveth thou servant a son, that I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Watch. Here's where she recognizes, I don't just need a normal son. And she said, if you read the Bible, and no razor shall ever touch his head. This was the breaking point. She realized, I don't just need a son. I need a specific son. I need one with long hair. I need one that a raise that never touches his head. Why are we settling for sons when God called us to birth Samuels? Why in the world church, even as a church family, why would we settle for just producing sons when God called us to birth Samuels? Why settle for a breakthrough when God's got a specific breakthrough? Why settle for a business when God's got a specific business? Why settle for just a son when you are called to produce Samuels? I want to tell you today, Jeremy Dunn, I am done working 
anointing to produce sons or images for people. I'm in this for Samuel. I can't be what you want me to be. I can't be what everybody expects me to be. I can't live up to your expectation. I can't live up to your desire. But I can be everything God designed me to be. I am done trying to produce a son to make other people happy. I'm being pushed into a season where it's no longer just give me a son. Give me Samuels that will turn a nation upside down. Give me spiritual Samuels that will turn government upside down. Give me Samuels that will change the structure and the DNA of our families. Give me some Samuels that come through kingdom culture that will change our county school district. Give me some Samuels that know how to grab a microphone and lead people in the presence of God. Give me some daddies that know how to be Samuels. Give me some mamas that know how to be Samuels. I don't want just sons. I want Samuels. Somebody give the Lord praise. So until, sweet Jesus, until her will is broken, she's going to go year after year, year after year. How many years did she pray for a son? It wasn't until she said, wait a second, I need a specific son. I'll give it back to you. And no razor will touch his head. And all of a sudden, the God of the universe has moved. Because now she's been taught. She's been provoked. She's been broke. And now she's about to get blessed. Because that's what valleys do to us. They teach us. They provoke us. They break us. They bless us. They teach us. They provoke us. They break us. And they bless us. And until her will got broken, God didn't know if she could, he could trust her with the calling yet. But the moment she was broken, all of a sudden the valley started to bless her. Remember the son was for her and Samuel was for God. And after she got done praying, she's still barren. And Eli said to her, go in peace. The God of Israel will grant your petition. And the Bible said that her face was no longer sad. She is barren, but she won. She don't have Samuel yet, but she won. Can I tell you that so many, some of you are waiting for the other side to come? thinking you're going to get victory on the other side of this valley? Baby, victory is found in the valley. I said it can be found in the valley. Her face was no longer sad, but she was still in her same predicament because Samuel wasn't the blessing. Samuel was the overflow of a healed woman. Samuel was the overflow of a woman that went to school, of a woman that got provoked into intimacy of a woman that got broken of her will, of a woman that had an encounter with God. And the healed woman overflowed into producing not just Samuel, but five children, the number of grace. And I'm here to tell you that you've got grace for your valley. You've got grace to walk through this thing. Let him teach you. I'm telling you today, the Bible said in due time that, that Hannah, that she conceived, I can guarantee you that your valley will testify if you will go to school and let it teach you, if you'll let it provoke you to greater intimacy, and if you will let it break you of your will, I can guarantee you, I know this is a blessing message, but I'm showing you how to, I guarantee you it'll bless you. I can guarantee you according to scripture that it will bless you. Let it teach you that you can't do it without it. Let it provoke you to a deeper level of intimacy. Let it break you of your will. And then your valley will begin to testify of the goodness of God. Can I speak to us corporately as a church? Let the church know corporately in leadership and staff, including myself, that we cannot do this without the Lord. Missy and I laid there talking about this message and identified seasons of our life where we were in valleys and the Lord taught us, uh-uh, you ain't going to do this without me. Provoked us to worship Him greater. Broke us of our own will. And then blessed us in this season. And you are perpetually working through that cycle of navigating those barren places. While you're stewarding a blessing, you are navigating a valley that is going to yield to you the next blessing that you're going to steward. Let it teach you. Let it provoke you. Let it break you. And let it bless you. Amen.
Did you get anything out of God's Word today?